everybody. We're shaking bacon. Morning, Jody. Morning, morning, morning. Ooh. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Hey, Becca. Oh, morning, Shelly. Just trying to make all my stuff. Waking up was a struggle today. Waking up was a struggle today. I agree. Why was waking up such a struggle today? I don't really even understand. I don't know. I do not know. Morning, everybody. Hey, Renee. It definitely was a bit of a struggle bus moment this morning, I have to agree. Hey, Alyssa, good morning. You already need a nap? You like my fridge? Thank you so much. Um, okay, what am I doing? What am I doing? Focus, Sasha. Focus, focus, focus. What's everyone else having this morning? I'm glad all of us are on the same page. Yeah, it's freaking weird, right? Like, I don't know. What's everyone else making this morning? Anything, anything good on y'all's end? Should I put an extra shot in my coffee just to try to wake myself up? It's like, hello, get it together, lady. I just realized your Beetlejuice mug matches the fridge with the vertical stripes. I never thought about that, but it totally does match the fridge. You're right. You're right about that. I would if I drank coffee, fair enough. Always an extra shot. Crazy morning, Moana brushed her teeth and freaked out screaming a spider was on her foot. I would have freaked out screaming if a spider was on my foot too. I'm not even in a freaking joke. I would, I would absolutely freak out if a spider was on my foot too. So I can't even, can't even blame her for that. Although does anyone follow, she doesn't post very much anymore, which really bums me out. Does anyone follow, what is it like modern arachnids or, or, or something like that? Mainline arachnids, mainstream arachnids. You know, I can't even think of what it actually is. I'm hungry. Is anyone else hungry? I'm feeling hungry. The screen, the dog bark, the husband yells for everyone to be quiet. One satisfied her land on my back while I was going to the. Nope. Nope. No, that does not sound like fun at all. That does not sound like fun at all. I'm trying to make the end of this lemon honey water situation that I've been drinking for reasons of having lost my voice and I assume my voice will be, my voice is, no, this is water. My coffee's in a different cup, but like I, I needed to heat up some water. I, I lost my voice last week. You started your race train today. Yeah, I'm supposed to start mine today too. Cause I'm gonna do, um, I decided that I'm gonna do the virtual runs over the summer to get the 100 year um, medals. I don't know if anyone else is gonna do that. Yeah, no, this is lemon water. Um, so I wanna start the race train today so that I can do those. Um, so. Yeah, that is that is my plan is to to do those races as a part of my training. Um, we'll see how it all goes down in the end. Obviously, and that's a plan. That is the plan. Pray for me, ready, ready. Ooh. Yeah, boy. 
She did it. I'm not doing those. Yeah, I really want to. I haven't signed up. They, or they haven't even gone on sale yet, but I really do want to do those. Um, I got to do this at my own pace. Well, the virtual races are only 5Ks, so it would mean doing... Um, it would mean doing three 5K runs over the summer, which I think is totally doable, because by that point, if we're not running 5K, psh, you know? But I just want the medals. Oh, you'll do the virtuals. You want to do the virtuals with me, Renee? Who wants to do the virtual races with me? Come on, friends. I have an app couch to marathon. Yeah, I've used that before. Who wants to do that? I'm hungry. Should I bring with me? Hold on, I'm not gonna have enough hands for this. Give me a second. Brandon, you wanna do it? My endurance is good from spinning, but running is such different muscles. Yeah, it is. You can walk them, Shira. They can be walked. I mean, I guess you could do it on a treadmill. I don't know. I know you can walk. I don't know if a treadmill counts, probably. I really don't know. You would have to look at the rules. I've never checked that because I hate treadmills, so I can't do it. I cannot run on a treadmill. It drives me nuts. What is a virtual race? Um, you just sign up for the race and then everybody like does the run at their own pace in their own town, but you still get like the medals and like all that stuff. I don't know. I've never done the virtual one before, but uh, yeah, the app, Couch to one mile, like it, you start with couch to like one mile, but I've never done one of the virtual races before, but the 100, K, the 100 anniversary medals are only virtual races. That's the only way they're offering them. And I think I want them. Yeah, for all. Which I know makes me like such a little whatever. You would go to rundisney.com. They're not on sale yet. But um, I think they go on sale. Maybe they go on sale later today or on the 25th. I'm not sure. But virtual races don't sell out as fast as the regular races. So it's not like when Jenna and I were signing up for the other one where we had to like be at the computer and like, uh, it's not like that to my knowledge. Usually the virtual race signups available. So you're like all in your own town so they don't have to worry about capacity. You know, Does that makes sense. I don't know why I woke up hungry. Freaking whatever. It was the Disney version of Taylor Swift tickets. She's so right. But we got it in the end, so it's all that matters. We did it in the end. It was stress and panic, laundry time. I'm gonna do laundry after this as well. I am going to do laundry after this as well because I need clothes. For those who, this will, this will only mean something to a small portion of people, but I'm going to LA tomorrow night or tomorrow afternoon. So I need clothes. Um, I'll leave your sock alone. Don't worry. I have to do the piggies laundry at lunch. That makes sense. I'm going to see Shira today for lunch, but Shira doesn't care what I wear. <laughs> um, uh, there's no event, Jenna. I'll tell you off live. Um, yep, I'm going to be gone. House party at Sasha's. No, no, there's no event, Jenna. Um, yeah, I'm gonna take Bird. I'm gonna take Bird to bring to Shira for lunch. Stop buying things for my lunch or performance. Why? 
Wait, why? Why would we tell you that? Why would we tell you to stop buying things for your London trip? For and a selfie. I know, I know. We forgot to take pictures last time and everybody destroyed us. I know. Because I'm buying too much. What are you buying for this London trip that you think is too much? London's number one on my bucket list, so you'd be hard pressed to find me to say no. Hey, Abby. Oh, Becca, hush. Sure is not cooking. We're meeting halfway and going out to lunch. Sure, should we should just go to the spectrum. Should we just go to the spectrum? Should we do that? Is there anything we could eat at the spectrum? What can we eat at the spectrum? It's easy, right? Because like everybody knows where it is and we don't have to wonder. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe we just go to the spectrum. There's a target there too. Maybe I can get even more glue while I'm there. The last time I was at the spectrum was when I was babysitting those kids. What a day. Y'all remember that. I think that was the early days of the book club chat. I just saw the creepiest TikTok. It was MJ cosplay that did not match up. Ooh, I hate that. Sorry guys, I know we're gonna read in just a second. I'm just finishing my breakfast. Becca, shut up. Becca. Those boys, fun times. Becca's trying to side message me, you guys. I'm gonna blow up her game. She's trying to side message me to get reactions. I'm almost done, I promise. We'll start reading in a minute. Trying, <laughs> succeeding. Clearly doing, not trying. Hey. Last piece. My corneta. I just fell off my bed trying not to squish. Oh, baby kitty. I'm making video of all the stuff I bought for lunch. Okay. That sounds good to us, or to me anyway. I guess I shouldn't speak for everybody. Um, okay, are we ready? We are going to continue Wasteland. Let's get cracking. I'm fine with that, Shelly. You can do like a London, this is what's coming with me haul or whatever. Hey, Shani. Yeah, I want to live vicariously too. I wish I could go to London. Literal top of my bucket list. Top, top, top of my bucket list. <clears throat> We're fine. Let's just read. Let's just, let's just cut off this insanity and read. Because yesterday got totally derailed, so we need to actually focus. Andrew Lee Weber comes in this chat and he derails everything. Um, no one texted now. It was my own brain that made me chuckle. It wasn't you and it wasn't anyone. It was my own brain. I chuckled at my own thoughts, Becca. Imagine that. Sometimes things come from within my mind. It's not always you. All right. Chapter nine. ADHD much? Yeah. 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 Much, much. Much, much, much. All right, chapter nine. 
As much as I would love to continue this tale and skip the rather lonesome chore of wasting the breath in my lungs to take time out of my busy schedule and spend that precious time explaining to you the heinous creature, the one known as Beck, I suppose I must. Partly because she was, after all, Chloe's twin sister, but mostly because if I had any agent overseeing this gig, he'd probably tell me that any second part to a story needs a minimal backdrop of the previous plot so that new readers and listeners of said story won't be completely lost. Well, if anyone rolling with me now had the privilege of rolling with me previously, welcome back. That's all of us. <clears throat> and to any newcomers who missed out, sit down, relax, and enjoy the ride. And considering that there are people here still after everything we've been through, I guess it wouldn't hurt to give a little premise where it's needed. Beck Sparks was the twin sister of Chloe Sparks, and that's pretty much where the familiarity stops. Yes, she does look identical to Chloe, and yes, she did fool me into thinking that she was Chloe the first time I met her, and yes, she did kiss me while posing as her sister just to mess with my mind. And yes, she is just that heartless. No, really, she is, like, literally heartless. Because when she was 18, she was blown to smithereens, like yours truly, by her own sister in a firefight. Long, sad story later, Beck wasn't salvageable as I was, which is, I guess, the most eloquent way of putting it. So after a few weeks of Dr. Cross rebuilding her, and as I just found out a few days ago, using half of his stockpile of Z90 on her, she made it out with a human brain and spinal column. I had taken severe sarcastic jabs at Beck, basically being a complete robot when I found out that she played a part in Chloe, the, played the part of Chloe just to get in my head, which wasn't the smartest move of mine considering how unstable she was then. Judging from the conversation I was able to witness between she and Ritu, not much had changed in the last few years. Ritu, I heard Beck say conversationally while I sidestepped to get a good look at the screen. I must say that you're looking ever so much paler than you did the last time that we spoke. I was standing right behind her, looking over her shoulder at Beck. Being in a comatose state for two and a half years must have done wonders for me because Beck looked a little more weathered than she had three years ago. I couldn't quite place anything drastically different until I saw the long black tresses were gone. She was rocking a buzz cut. Dr. Cross is moving his plan forward much more quickly than I originally projected, Ritu told her, seemingly unscathed by Beck's rudeness. His test subject did extremely well in his first trial testing today, so he isn't going to stick around for long. Test subject. Nothing like a good slap of reality every once in a while, I guess. And then my mouth dropped open when Beck said, who's this test subject you keep going on about talking about Dr. Cross all the time? I could cry tears of joy that my audio and video are still in sync, knock on wood. There, I knocked on wood for you. I thought I'd missed something. Surely if Ritu was a planted rebel spy, then she would have told Beck that Jericho Johnson still lived, right? I don't know who he is, Ritu told her. But if he continues to strengthen over the next week, Cross said that he might have to take him to Anchorage when he leaves. Beck let out an aggravated sigh. I'm dying, Ritu. Forgive me if I seem disinterested in Dr. Cross's travel plans. I contacted you so that I could see, so that you could find out what's wrong with me, not so that you could tell me to find a good doctor who plans on. He won't be back for a long time if he leaves again, Ritu said, interrupting her, more so if he brings his new weapon with him. Beck scoffed before going into a fit of coughs, but since I wasn't sure if she even had lungs, I was a little confused. At the horrid sounds she was making during the coughing fit, when she'd finally regained her composure somewhat, she said, so he's a weapon now? Knock on wood comes from people knocking on a crucifix for good luck. Eesh. I know what Cross is planning for using him, Ritu said. Weapon is the only plausible definition. Look, I don't know or care what Cross plans on doing with his new pet. All I care about now is not dying, and I need Cross for that, not his latest project. Beck shot her a le look, leaning forward menacingly. If I don't have him by the end of the weekend, I'm coming right through the front door and you're going to be the first white-coated coward I'm paying a visit to. Her voice rose during the threat and her face glaringly vanished. Goodbye to you too, Ritu muttered to herself before standing, half of her body phasing through me because I'd been standing close to the heated exchange. Ritu sighed and placed her hands on the now darkened glass desk and leaned forward, looking weary. Then her hollow tab lit up. Did she believe you? I heard Cross ask. Nodding slightly, Ritu answered, yes. Good. Letting Beck back in, 
Letting Beck make the first idiotic move is essential, he said. All I need is for her to come here and then Jericho will do the rest. I just stood there, listening, waiting, and seething. When will you activate him? Ritu asked, after his training. If his brain hasn't recorded any of his abilities, then I won't be able to manually access them once he's under my control. Jericho does not suspect me, she told him. As far as he is concerned, he and I are secretly in league against you. Can you keep up that ruse for another week? What the hell, Heimer, is wrong with these people? I mean, I knew that they were evil in a few seconds into their chat, but the worst part is that they were talking about it like they were discussing, I don't know, picking up a cake for a low-key office party. Calm, casual, friendly talk that included, but was not limited to betrayal, murder, and mind control. Which reminded me that I had a new super powerful body slumbering a few floors below me that I'd just been waiting for the chance to try out again. And I thought that you were educated, I said, even though I knew Ritu couldn't hear me. And then I closed my eyes and I was back in my body again. It was time to give Cross and his horde of scientists a test that they would never forget. The first thing I did was put on my boots and hooded long coat because I had a feeling that I was about to need warm clothes again real soon. I just pulled on my last boot when I heard a knock on the door. Who is it? I asked in a sing-songy voice after I'd stopped at the front door. Three, two. I opened the door and smiled cheerfully at her. Wow, look who's back. Come on in, pal. She gave me a semi-puzzled look when she walked past me. You were vague? I was indeed, I told her, closing the door. I tried to sleep, but the sound of your lying a few, four, few floors above me was just too much. Ritu froze before she entered the large living room and fell with her back to me. She didn't say anything. I asked, say, friend, if a guy wanted to bust out of here, hypothetically, of course, how would he do it? Turning, Ritu looked at me with the classic who me look, to which I responded menacingly, oh yeah, you, dearest, smirk. Jericho, eh, just don't, I said. She backed away when she saw me walking towards her. Here I thought that I had a magically, that I had a magically, Here I thought that I had a magical confidant who was going to help me get my revenge, but you know what I ended up realizing after hearing your little two-way discussion upstairs? Ritu bumped against my large window and I put my hands on the thick glass, my arms on either side of her. I can do revenge just fine by myself. And then I pulled, my, pulled back my right fist and smashed it into the window with all my strength, creating a large hole. Ritu screamed and covered her head as large gusts of wind and snow blew in and shattered glass went everywhere. Grabbing the front of her shirt and lab coat, I lifted her, dangling her out into the storm. Tell me how to get out of here now. I shook her and she screamed, kicking her feet wildly. Growling, I grabbed a piece of metal that was jutting out and from my punch and leaned out further. Tell me or you're dead. I roared over the gusts of winds. You need the passcode for the third floor, she shrieked, going, as, going limp as her eyes closed against the freezing cold, pelting her face unmercifully. Give them to me. I can't from here. Too bad. I loosened my fingers and she grabbed my forearm. Wait, I can give them to you, Ritu screamed. And she began shuddering from what must have been sobs, only her tears froze instantly to her face. She held out her right arm and her hollow tab appeared in the snow flurries. She hit a few icons and my hollow tab lit up on my arm. Just wave your arm over, over the, do the door pan, Ritu muttered, her eyes beginning to close. Thanks, I said, swinging back into my blustering suite. I headed for my room, dragging Ritu behind me, and not just because I couldn't have carried her, but simply because I just didn't care about her getting a few scrapes. After I tossed her onto the bed, I wrapped the heavy blanket around her. Peace out, Ritu, I told the unconscious woman. I'll see you around. And then I exited the room and headed for the elevator. It was time to check out. Dang, Jericho got mean. Oof. the heck? Chapter 10. I was about halfway down when I realized that I should have just jumped out the hole I made in the window. I didn't know if I would have survived the fall, but my half-cocked plan was already formulating the way it might not pan out the way that I wanted it to. My short, peaceful elevator ride lasted only about 10 floors before an alarm began blaring, letting everyone inside the enormous building know that I was escaping. The third floor wasn't supposed to be an easy way out, I was thinking, but I just couldn't feel scared or even the least bit apprehensive about the oncoming onslaught. A bit aggressive there, buddy. Agreed. It was a bit aggressive. 
I mean, like, but I guess when you're part robot, you can't help it. I don't really know. Actually, I felt downright excited about it. I began drumming my gloved fingers on my side as I watched the floors tick down during my descent, and then I felt an odd twinge in my palms while I was drumming away. Frowning, I glanced down at my gloves, flexing them into fists a few times, and feeling a subtle vibration rush through my hands and slither off my arms and into my brain. I knew what I could do. I hadn't tried it or even thought about it, but right then, without the least bit of practice or shocking revelation, I knew what I could do with my hands. I was still smiling when the elevator dinged on the third floor and the doors opened slowly. I stepped out into a shockingly white hallway, which seemed to be filled with armored guards who all seemed to be pointing guns at me. The hall was wide, as far as halls go, and the 10 guards blocked my way, and they were only taking a stance on the the 10 guards blocking my way were only taking a stance on the far side in front of the only door in sight. I wasn't exactly sure how this place was set up. I was beginning to think that Ritu had sent me on a wild goose chase just to get me captured. Evening, guys, I called to them as I started slowly walking towards the entourage of masked guards. No battle armor. Good. Stand down, one of the guards shouted at me as I advanced towards them at a calm pace. Can't, bud, I told him, slipping a hand into my coat pockets. I've kind of got somewhere to be right about now, so I'd appreciate it if you and your little group would just kindly... And then I ran into a shimmering force field, staggering me a little from the shock it administered upon contact. Really? I said in frustration. Jericho, come in, I heard Ritu buzz in my head. Go for Jericho, I said, pacing in front of the light blue haze of a shield. Please tell me you didn't lie to me. That's the only way to get outside. Taking the elevator to the bottom floor leads to basement. You'll need to get the passcodes to get the, to get all, you need passcodes for all three to get outdoor being blocked by guards. I gave you all of them now, but you'll need to get past the decontamination field. No kidding, I said dryly. The hall is strictly designed for cleansing against anyone who spent more than 12 hours outside, she said, and I heard key clicks. You can deactivate them from the other side of the wall if you... Before she finished, I punched through the wall panel and her, ripped hard, pulling it free from, the expose, from exposing the gizmo powering field. You're slow, I said. Now what? Just destroy this thing? You could, but I would suggest using the field's energy for yourself. I think you already know how to do that. I glanced at the blue shield. She was right. I did know what I could do. I'm sorry if I never explained all the mental pictures and feelings that going along with what was happening in my body most of the time, but I'll explain it later, I promise. Removing my black gloves, I pocketed them and stepped close enough to the shield to put my palms on it. I ground my boots into the floor, getting better footing. When a blue haze tried to repel me backwards, I gritted my teeth and pushed hard, and suddenly, the with all the struggle vanished and my right hand went through the shield. The guards shuffled uneasily and cocked their assault rifles as they watched me, looking at my hand on the other side. I walked through the force field and saw that Ritu was right. There was another force field about 10 feet away. Turning back, I placed my left hand back on the shield. I took a deep breath and then pulled my hand into a fist and the blue force field shuddered once before being sucked into it. I could feel it all coming in, filling up my hand and overflowing into my forearm as the current climbed up my arm. I wasn't being shocked, burned, or hurt. The only feeling associated with charging up was, well, I felt like I was being charged up. After all the shield, after all, the shield had vanished into my fist. I opened my hand and saw a faint blue light flicker into my palm. Sweet, I muttered to myself before turning back to the final shield. I didn't even touch this one. All I did was raise my right hand and it just came to it, looking awesome as it went into my palm. The same charged feeling happened whilst I was in Thor mode. Ritu buzzed in, don't get too much, Jericho. Why not, I asked. But then I felt what she was talking about. Pure energy began seeping from my frame because I couldn't hold it all. By the time I finished pulling the second force field, my arms were wreathed in lightning. Cackling loudly, I winced against the blue bolts. Not from pain, just from, you know, not being used to having visible electricity all over me. And then the guards, who had told me to stand down, tried again, shouting at me and waving his little gun. They have been told to take you alive, Ritu informed me. So they aren't allowed to kill me? No. I flicked my eyes from my hands to the band of poor sods pointing guns at me. Sorry, guys, I told them, holding up my arms and pointing two finger guns at them. Nothing personal. And then I fired. The bolts that escaped my hands pushed me back several feet as the blue streaks hit the streaming troops. Excuse me, screaming troops. 
The stuff went everywhere, too, clawing up the walls and the ceilings as the guards were blown in all directions. When the smoke cleared and the crackles finally died down, the last feeling I had was a slight tingling of pain in my palms. What was that? I asked as I stepped over the quivering guards. That was something Cross has been wanting to see for a very long time. And that was the birth of a new species. Sounds good, I said, kicking the white door off its hinges. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a few more butts to kick before I can get out of here. I entered the doorway and headed down the only flight of stairs, my boots making a resounding echoing sound off the concrete walls. You never told me whose side you're on, I said. You didn't ask before hanging me out the window in the blizzard. I shrugged as I continued down. I've decided my new philosophy is to shoot first and search the corpse for chocolate chip cookies afterwards. Might live longer doing that. Take the door on your right at the bottom of the stairs, Ritu said, ignoring my new philosophy. It will lead to short hallway and then to the lobby. She hesitated before saying, there will be more guards, but there's also a possibility of several citizens. Great, I said, opening the door at the bottom of the stairs. I could always use a few body shields. When she didn't respond, I said, I'm kidding, Ritu. You should be able to do the same thing. You should be able to do the same thing you did to the decamination field and virtually anything else electrical in the lobby. Use that to your advantage, she said. And I heard more keyboard clicks. These guards know that you're coming and may not be as vigilant with orders now that they see how dangerous you are. I'm not bulletproof, Ritu, I said, stopping in front of the door leading into the lobby, but I'm open to suggestions. If you can get good feel of your energy level, you could possibly create the makeshift shield of your own. So just wing it. Pretty much. I sighed, pushing open the door and entering the lobby, and I saw a dozen guards waiting on me. Come on, guys, I said as they advanced towards me with their weapons cocked and ready. I don't have to hurt. I stopped, wondering why I didn't have to hurt them. I mean, they were in my way, were they not? They were trying to keep me here as Cross's slave, right? Yeah, I said, starting my hands back up. Never mind. And then the lobby was filled with lightning. Hmm. Mm hmm. Jeez, John. Multitasking while you listen. Jericho's getting intense, you guys. Jericho is getting intense. Blinding snow was everywhere as I tromped down the covered sidewalk through the mega blizzard that had gripped the city. It got deeper by the minute, and I was beginning to think that checking out of the science camp during a snowstorm wasn't the best idea I'd ever had. Nice, JJ, I said to myself. Great plan. I guess it wasn't too bad considering I wasn't cold at all due to my suit, but the snow was becoming bothersome as I trudged through it. The other big problem was that I hadn't really thought about anything past escaping, so I wasn't sure where to go or who to go to. Well, I suppose that wasn't exactly true. I knew who I wanted to go to. Considering the rebels had been able to remain hidden from three different war factions for years on end, I was guessing that I couldn't just knock on doors and find them. I did, however, remember where I had surfaced three years ago, the day that we raided Klaus's facility. It was a bit hazy, but after almost an hour of snow travel, I was able to remember enough destroyed buildings and ruptured landmarks to make it back to the general area. The location that I remembered had rushed and had rushed to, had been a park years ago. The remains of a merry-go-round was what I remember most, but since the snow was now waist deep, I was betting that finding the familiar item was out of the question. And then I bumped into something buried in the snow right in front of me. I glanced around, but I still couldn't discern any kind of landmark to help me. The buildings were all considerably far away, and so I was hoping that maybe I'd miraculously bumped into the merry-go-round. I dipped my gloved hand into the soft snow, trying to touch what I bumped into, and in a few seconds I found it gripping it with my right hand. It felt like some kind of metal pipe through my glove. And at any rate, I sighed with relief, being lucky enough to stumble across just the thing I'd been searching for. And then the pipe in my hand moved. Shouting, I let go of whatever I grabbed and fell back into the snow, sweeping my arms and padding through the whiteness, just trying to get as much space between me and anything beneath the snow. The area in front of me shuddered and snow blasted everywhere as the thing that I had woken up left from the snow and soared into the air, landing about 10 feet to my left. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I shouted in frustration into the wind, continuing my backpedaling. Oh my God. It was an enormous spider. <sighs> really? Today of all days. This is your fault. 
For starters, it looked like a tarantula with a shocking white hair, not the best enemy to face off in the middle of a blizzard. Chloe had told me about ice spiders before, stating that during the winter, most of them stayed below ground in the abandoned tunnels riddling the city. She also told me that baby ice spiders were almost four feet across, which didn't sound like a baby to me. Apparently, the one I walked into was somewhat of an adolescent. He wasn't the mammoth of 10 feet across that Chloe had said was the size of a full-grown one, but it was bigger than four feet by a long shot. What are you doing up here? I said, sidestepping slowly as the ice spider focused on me and began sidestepping too with its eyes focused on me. It hissed and suddenly lashed out at me with one of its front legs protruding into the snowy air. I put what little juice I had left into my hand and took aim only to see that the target had vanished. Or had it? Squinting against the heavy snow, I tried to detect the white spider. After I searched for almost 30 seconds, I frowned, turning off my hands. I guess maybe I'd scared it off or something. I resumed sloshing through the snow that was getting deeper and began heading for a nearby building. My idea was that I could at least get inside and get away from all the snow so that I could get my bearings, and since my magical landmark Marigarand hadn't decided to show up for a second date, I was almost to the crumbling building when the ice spider I thought I'd scared off decided to try its hand at killing me. All eight of its hands, actually. When I heard the hiss, I swung around to face it, but it wasn't there. To say that I was impressed by the ice spider's camouflage would be a gross understatement. I mean, that thing could blend in like a freaking ninja. I was about to latch, it wasn't until it latched onto my left leg with its enormous fang from somewhere under the surface of the snow that I realized it probably had been there the whole time. Actually, I was a little relieved to discover that my eyesight wasn't as bad as I was beginning to think. A notion that I was too busy dwelling on as I was being dragged through the snow by a man-eating spider. After several obscenities being cut short by mouthfuls of snow, my arachnid captor, my arachnid captor pulled me into the building that I had been heading for anyway. Great minds think alike, I shouted at the thing as soon as we cleared the snow. I punched it right between its eight eyes and the ice spider made a sort of yelp slash whine, dropping my leg and jumping away. We were in a poorly lit area that looked like it used to be used as some sort of gift shop where someone had made home, which burned and later became a schoolhouse and then a library and then a slaughterhouse before finally becoming a rung down shop that I was facing an ice spider in. Huh, that has a nice ring to it. I thought so then too, and I quickly had a vision of one day opening ye old tavern on Svalbard and calling it Ice Spider Inn. While the spider continued making a ridiculous noise and shaking its head slightly from my punch, I looked at my leg grimacing because I knew that I was bleeding to death. <laughs> Only there wasn't a drop of blood. Oh, right. Robot leg. Metal doesn't taste good, does it? And then the thing tackled and landed on my back. And I landed on my back with it on top of me. And I instantly went for my head with those enormous, awful fangs. Here's a tip. Normally when two humans are fighting, one of them happens to be positively feral at best and tries to tear the other man's throat out with his teeth. Yes, I've actually had that almost happen to me before. Best retaliation the almost bitten can do against the biter is to grab the crazy man's neck and hope that he is strong enough to keep him at bay. Trying to incorporate this maneuver into fighting off a huge spider doesn't work that well. So don't try it next time you're being tackled by a nice spider. Since it didn't have a neck or shoulders for me to get a good hold on, I grabbed the only other thing that I could think of, the huge fangs that I was just expounding about. Not the face, I growled between clenched teeth, and then I felt it coming. It began like it always did, a small hum in my palms. Although it was hard to tell because I was also trying to, you know, not get my handsome face crunched off by a spider. Time's up, I told the monster, pulling my hands together and switching both fangs to my left hand while slowly pushing the spider's mouth up to expose the, huh, I guess spiders do sort of have necks because that's what I punched through with a fistful of lightning. My first feeling was of how awesome I felt slaying a giant man-eating spider in real life, just like I'd been doing a role-playing game since I was nine. The second feeling was the black blood running all over me, and then I screamed like a little girl and shoved the carcass off of me, struggling to get to my feet and attempting to wipe at the blood. Ew, 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 ugh, gross, I muttered. My right arm and shoulder were the really nasty parts. The rest of my body lucked out on that particular ice spider kill. I just totally leveled up on that one. I'll hear from book club while I get ready for my concert. Your concert? What kind of concert? Wait, 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 do I know about this? I feel like I don't know about this. What concert, Juliana? I poked around the burnt out building for a long time, going through the floors thoroughly and scavenging, mainly because you know that's what you're supposed to do in a post-apocalyptic world. Most of the rooms still had a lot of stuff in them, and I took my time sifting through it all because the snow was probably getting close to 20 feet deep. 
I was hoping that whenever it stopped, I'd be able to walk on top of the packed snow and continue searching for the rebels. Only they were most likely in a, all snug by the fire underground, drinking hot cocoa and eating cinnamon rolls. They weren't just going to be walking around the snowy streets for kicks. I'm seeing Brett. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know who he is. But it's so early in the morning. You're getting ready now? Isn't it, isn't it early to be getting ready? What time's the concert? What the hell, Heim, JJ? I thought to myself, standing quickly. Underground. That's where I needed to get. Couldn't have been far from the park, even if I couldn't find an entrance then... I was about to make one. And with that, my mind exited the room and I headed back down the stairwell, probably on the fourth floor before I heard the troop of soldiers shouting orders to search the building and find me. Jeez, I just couldn't catch a break. It's about an hour away, so we're going early to walk around the city. Oh, cool, cool, cool. That makes sense. That makes sense. Oh. What time is it? 7.38. I could probably read another one more chapter. You think Joshua's going to do the virtual one with you too? Nice. Nice. I don't know when sign up there. This book is Wasteland. Wasteland. I have mentally checked out during the spider section. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Spiders are gross. Spiders are gross. I don't like them. Yeah, we can read this next chapter. All right, chapter 12. He can't be that far, I heard an official sounding woman yell at her cohorts. The only problem was that her voice sounded like it was coming through a radio. Or since I've been in the future long enough, you know, it was probably like, a chick rocking a mechanized battle armor or something. And when I heard them start to move out, I confirmed that my hypothesis due to the sounds of very heavy footsteps coupled with whining gears and gyro clacking whirling was true. I glanced toward the nearest window of the fourth floor only to see the last sliver of dim light being put out by the heavy snow. Ah, oh, man. I walked fast down the hallway to the other side of the floor and saw that the opposite window wasn't covered yet. I just tried to open it at first and I figured maybe, just maybe, that wouldn't make a lot of noise. But then I heard a shout, all units move to the fourth floor and engage target. I growled in frustration and elbowed the window out before taking a step back and diving through it. Diving out of the fourth story window normally won't get you the best escape of the year award because most people wouldn't be alive to claim it unless there's a mammoth freaking blizzard outside and you fall literally two feet and land onto soft snow. I was relieved that the snow was compact enough not to make struggling through it impossible, which wouldn't have been a problem, only that I was trying to get away from killer robot men. I had gone about 15 feet into the cold whiteness before I realized that this wasn't going to work. I got to a crouching position, turned back to the building, and pushed hard into the snow with my legs, leapt onto the side of the apartment building, and began scaling the side quickly. I heard some radio chatter, but it was too far away for me to understand what was said. I made it to the top easily, only to find that the roof was covered with snow. Duh. And I glanced left and right as I held onto the shattered window pane, looking for a way out of my current predicament. And then I heard a shout and glanced down to see a helmet peering up at me through the fifth floor window. I see him, he shouted, putting his head back. And then everything slowed, and I just knew what was happening. The snow flurries fled by slowly in my line of vision, and I knew that the guy who had spotted me was checking his rounds in the process of leaning back out the window to pop a shot at me. I can't explain it. All I can say is what I've been saying. I just knew. And the best part about just knowing was happening what was happening and or about to happen was that my reactions were almost automatic. That I'd been sailing into action and not knowing until I was halfway there. In this case, I didn't know until after it was done and that I had been released, that I had released the wall and spun into a perfect free fall dive next to the building, my arms outstretched. Just as the man in the suit dipped half of his body out the window to take a shot, I was there, my right arm hitting his chest and pulling him out of the window into the snow. We went deep into the whiteness when we landed, causing a crater, the walls of which collapsed onto us, and we were soon buried. I still had a good hold on the guy in the suit, who was by that time radioing his buddies for help. I grabbed his throat as my hands began humming softly, and I felt a power from the suit flowing into my arm. He's shutting down my... were the last words he was able to send out before his suit went powerless. 
The snow was everywhere now and I could barely move or breathe when I let out my new charge. The blue white blast was issuing from my hand and instantly melting the snow within a good 20 foot radius. And then I was falling before landing into the water that I just made, which began freezing as I kicked under semi warm surface towards the first floor window of the apartment building. It was almost all frozen by the time I made it, punching through the dingy window and falling into it. The last part to exit was my foot and it got stuck in the now solid wall of ice. What the, what? I barked, turning my right hand towards my leg, letting off just enough juice to free my foot before landing in a wet heap on the ragged floor. I can't believe that worked. I muttered to myself as I lay there for a second before rolling onto my knees and climbing to my feet. I just could feel my jumpsuit and long coat fighting off the frost that was trying to build up as I began sloshing along the hallway. Somehow, after what I'd just done, fighting the remaining guards on foot didn't seem that bad anymore. I heard heavy footsteps on the floor above me, so I stopped, waiting for them to come down the stairs where I had my right hand aimed already at them. And then one of them tore through the ceiling and landed behind me, planting a good kick to my back and sending me skidding almost all the way down the hallway until I connected with the far wall below the window next to the stairs. Shaking my head, I got to my hands and knees. Target is down, I heard my surprised attacker stay, say. All units proceed to the first floor to... His voice trailed off when he saw me climb to my feet and spit blood onto the icy floor. Now I was just mad. All units, he tried to say before I jumped the entire gap between us and placed my boots into his chest piece, knocking him off his feet onto his back with me crouched onto his dented armor. He swung at me with his right arm and I caught it easily, sending all the volts I had into his hand. After he stopped jerking, I stood and turned back to the troops coming down the stairs. Come on, I shouted at them, opening my hands at my sides, palms turned slightly towards the oncoming troops and letting the visible blush white spark, bluish white sparks dance and lick all over my hands. The streaks climbed up my wrist and up my coat sleeves. There were three of them and they had all stopped before attacking, watching me through their red eyed masks. The same red vein pulsing up and down the black armor of their suits and meeting at the chest piece emblazoned with the scythe and hammer emblem. Their suits were just a lot bigger than the rogues I had encountered my first time coming to the future. So you're rogues, I told them, taking a step forward. Shouldn't you guys be like raiding the fascists or the bears and leaving random citizens to their own devices? You escaped from Dr. Cross's facility, didn't you? One in the middle asked, taking me off guard because I didn't think that these guys were exact location dispatches, but also because the speaker was a girl. Depends on who's asking. The woman in the suit closed the gap between us, holding the hands of her suit to show me that she wasn't trying anything. We were scanning local lines to tap and overheard Cross sending out soldiers to retrieve someone who had escaped. She stopped about five feet in front of me, her suit making me over a foot shorter, and I stared up at her and she down at me. We figured anything worth risking lives for in a Category 7 blizzard might be worth acquiring for ourselves. I described talking to someone who was in battle armor before as not the best way to become acquainted due to the fact that the person's voice sounded a little deeper and also you can't see their face. I was intrigued by her accent though, which was certainly the thickest Australian accent I'd ever heard since Crocodile Dundee. I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I can't really do an Australian accent, so this girl's not getting an Australian accent. I'm not acquirable at the moment, sweetheart, I told her coldly. I'm just trying to get underground. Turning her helmeted head slightly, she said, you must be looking for the rebels. You're out searching for the rogues and then, well, today's your lucky day. I don't want any trouble, I said. Tell that to your hands, mate, she said, pointing at the armored fingered hands in question. Shutting them off, I felt the juice come back inside and stop somewhere on my chest. You dead, Jax? The rogue woman asked the person I was standing on. No, we heard a groan and the suit powered back up, lights flickering as he slowly got to his feet. Good, and then she asked, what's your name, mate? Jericho, I told her. Jericho Johnson. Lovely name you got there, mate. She said, hitting a button on the side of her helmet and raising the mask up, exposing her pale skin, red curls, and no joke. Deep red eyes at me. Name's Red, she told me, extending her suited hands. And after seeing what you just did to some of my best men with those hands of yours, allow me to say that the pleasure is certainly and will always be mine. Wow, the next chapter is really long. Holy crap. 
Okay, the next chapter is really long. There's no way that we're gonna get through it today. So we will start with the next chapter tomorrow. And the next chapter, chapter 13 says Piper at the top of it. I'm just gonna tell you guys that. It says Piper at the top. Um, all right, well, we got through a good amount of chapters today, way more than we did yesterday. So that is something. I need to download yesterday and today's lives so that I can upload them. I gotta go package slime. I gotta go meet Shira and et cetera and so on. Yeah, we've all been waiting to hear about Piper. I'll see you all later. After I acquire clear glue from Shira, we can make more slime. That's what's up. See y'all later.